Hello, my friends. In this video, I'm going to be referencing this book. It's called Build a Better Brain. It's written by Peter Hollins, and his last name is spelled H O L L I N S, just in case that's difficult to read in the video. So now I'll give you an overview of what this video will entail. First of all, right after this introduction, I will give you some data that supports the validity of the information presented in this video. And this, inf this data will be taken from this book. Actually, most of the video will be referencing this book. It's a great book. I highly recommend you purchase it and read it for yourself. I've learned a lot from it. Then after that, I'm just going to go ahead and emphasize and present to you some very interesting points that this book presents that is related to the topic. And I hope that you will find it both useful and interesting. And then finally, I will close the video by presenting to you the technique that this book recommends for performing a visualization or positive self-talk technique. Um, and I think I will even go ahead and read aloud at the end of the video after I present the framework for the visualization method. I will go ahead and give you the example that the book has, that the author has written in this book. So let's get into it. First of all, the data. I'll go ahead and start with the second point of data here, which is very interesting. It's regarding basketball and how visualization helped to make participants do free throws better. So there was an experiment. It was in Australia and the researcher Alan Richardson ran a trial on a visualization on a group of basketball players. <clears throat> he divided them into three different groups and gave each a 20 day assignment involving free throws. All of the groups physically practiced making free throws on the first and last days of the 20 day period. So they all knew how to do it. One group was instructed to practice making free throws for 20 minutes every day. A second group was instructed to do nothing in between the first and 20th days. Finally, a third group was told only to visualize themselves making free throws between the first and last days of the trials. This process did not just mean the players pictured themselves sinking so shots successfully. It also included visualizing them missing free throws and practicing correcting their shot. The results were eye-opening. The group that physically practiced for 20 days boosted their free throw success rate by 24%. But astonishingly, the visualization group also improved by 23% almost as much as the practice squad and unsurprisingly the group that did nothing they did no visualization no practice they didn't improve the free throw ability at all here the data that i just presented to you regarding the basketball free throw shooting this clearly illustrates the immense power of visualization if you're an athlete for example and this is just one possible example you could be visualizing yourself giving a speech you could be visualizing all sorts of skill based things I'm gonna even get into physical um, benefits with the next data point that I'm gonna give you with uh, an example from this book that's gonna illustrate the value in this whole concept so clearly visualization helps improve any skill-based activity. So now 
we'll go into the second example. The Learner Research Institute, and Learner is spelled L-E-R-N-E-R, -E so they conducted a study in which participants were told to form mental images of themselves flexing their pinky fingers and elbows. Others were instructed to physically do the flexing. After 12 weeks, the group doing the physical flexes showed a 53% increase in their finger strain. But the groups that only did the mental work showed increases of between 13% and 35%. I know, it sounds like, oh, it's not as much as the, it's not as much of an increase in strength as the physical training. So, therefore, it's not even worth doing that sort of training. But if you are having that train of thought, you're kind of missing the point. You are missing the point because even with something like strength training, visualization still showed increases for those participants, which is absolutely insane because you would think that those things are totally unrelated how can thinking with your mind produce an increase in strength but apparently it does and the data supports it but with skill-based training visualization visualization is very beneficial for that and it's slightly beneficial for strength-based training well pretty beneficial but very extremely beneficial for skill-based training And this is why your brain shapes itself based on whatever it sees or it is exposed to, whether it's real or imagined. If you say or even just think, I'm going to finish a dec decathlon, decathlon in record time. Sorry, that was a hard word to pronounce. The brain treats it no differently than if you actually finish a decathlon in record time your neural pathways are reshaping themselves based on your declaration alone so you don't even need to visualize is what this is saying you're still going to find benefits just from saying i'm going to do this and i'm going to do that and if you do that every day you're still going to have benefits and you're going to get better at things so that's helpful to the neuroscience of saying yes and the thing is most of the time this works against us because we tend to have a negative dialogue with ourselves about our flaws and our probabilities of failing. However, like all things neurological, this is neutral and it can be harnessed to your benefit. To affect neuroplasticity, you only need to state your intent verbally or mentally. The brain just can't distinguish between an act and a thought if the thought is present and conscious enough. So, basically, self-talk can have dramatic and unexpected effects. So, that's the data that I wanted to give you. Now, I'm going to go ahead and just emphasize and verbalize some very interesting, some points which I thought were very interesting from this book before I get into the framework for how to do visualization and for saying the example of how to do a visualization. So, self-talk doesn't strictly have to be verbalized. Research has shown that our brains use the same neural networks to both move and just think about moving. Imagining a positive action or plan over and over again might not have an impact on our physical status, but it has a momentous effect on neuroplasticity. That mental groove can be worn without you lifting a single finger. Physiologists also strongly suspect that self-talk can alter how you perceive yourself. 
Self-talk literally gives you a chance to reform your brain with your own standards, free from outside influence and perceptions. If you say what you want your reality to be, eventually it will become so. And that can build your self-confidence to amazing levels. And how you talk to yourself is crucial as well. Psychologist Ethan Cross of the University of Mich Michigan, Michigan, yeah, Michigan, stumbled upon a potential trick that might sound a little precious, but could also pay off in higher dividends. Talking to yourself as if you're someone else in the third person. Cross found that when some people talk to themselves using the pronoun I, as in just the capital letter I, they may be unconsciously creating more stress and strain on their psyches. Taking self-ownership infers a lot of responsibility and expectation, and that can make someone trying to effect change a little nervous. For example, I'm going to ace that entrance exam. Or another example, I'm going to get through this family crisis with flying colors. These are good things to say, but by using the word I, the speaker may be putting more pressure on themselves. So Cross ran an experiment with volunteers in which they were all told that they'd be giving a speech with only five minutes in which they could prepare themselves. So they only had five minutes to prepare for the speech. While they were getting ready, he told some of the volunteers to talk to themselves using the pronoun I. He asked the others either to address themselves as you or by their given names. The I group tended to stress out, saying things like, I only have five minutes to get ready for this. I can't do it in five minutes. I'm going to be flailing up there. The messages the you group said were very, very different. For example, Patrick, you've got this. You've given speeches like this millions of times in the past. You'll come through fine. These results point toward the idea that addressing yourself as a third person is somehow an objectivity enabler. It forces a perception upon you as an outsider, looking at your situation from a distance. In that framework, you're much more likely to see yourself as a problem solver rather than a victim, and your statements of support are more likely to be positive, more rational, and less emotionally charged. In general, it makes you a nicer person to yourself. That change in wording alone could have a significant effect on your neural pathways. All right, so that's it for that chapter. Now let me get into the visualization chapter. So visualization, quite simply put, is detailed imagination. You use your mind's eye to picture yourself executing whatever it is you're planning to accomplish. Visualization helps you build a sense of self-awareness and expectation. It's a mental rehearsal to understand the experience and associated emotions. And believe it or not, it works. And then the book gets into the example that we have already covered. So the conclusion from the study is that visualization causes changes even when unaccompanied by actual physical work. The brain and its neural pathways can be conditioned and strengthened just as muscles and the cardiovascular system can. Seeing is believing, no matter the type of scene. You can use this tool to make yourself whatever you want to be. For instance, visualize a situation you are afraid of and make all the tough, disciplined, and unpleasant choices in your mind. Play it through with as many details as possible. How does it feel? We can start to understand that our fear is rooted in ignorance and we can start to build a relationship with a feeling of comfort with discomfort. It almost seems like an oxymoron. Almost all of us hesitate and want to retreat to a comfort zone when confronted with something foreign. 
But if you make risky situations as familiar as possible, this instinct will decrease accordingly. Visualization is easy, but as with any process, it works best with guided steps. So that's what I'm about to get into. It is helpful to approach visualization as meditation, a quiet but concentrated immersion into your thoughts and imagination. One particularly effective technique involves five steps. Step one, relaxation. Step two, imagining the environment. Step three, viewing as a third person. So viewing the whole execution and process from a third person point of view. Step four, viewing as first person. Step five, coming back to reality. So let me describe each step. Now, I'm going to shut off this light to save my car battery because this is all just audio at this point. So step one, relaxation. The first step involves getting yourself into a tranquil state physically and mentally. It involves techniques like finding a quiet spot, taking deep and measured breaths, and closing your eyes to get into a meditative state. Step two, imagining the environment. The second step is building a detailed mental picture of the situation, surroundings, and specific objects that you'll be working with when you finally take action. Step three, viewing as third person. The third part of this method is picturing yourself doing an activity the way someone else would, how you would appear in the eyes of someone watching you. Step four, viewing as first person. The fourth part is an intensive imagining of yourself doing the activity, how your senses and emotions would react and feel while you're doing it. And step five is coming back to reality. The final part involves slowly re-emerging from your visualization into the physical world, ready to take on the challenge for real. So now let's try a sample visualization. It's a situation we frequently find ourselves in, but for some it causes utter panic and terror. It's delivering a speech. Here's how the visualization might go. Step one, relax. Find a quiet spot where you won't be disturbed or interrupted for a few minutes, lying on a couch or bed with the windows and doors closed. Breathe deeply from your stomach. Take as much time as you need to let all areas of tension in your body dissipate. Finally, close your eyes. Step two, imagine the environment. Make a detailed survey of the room and space where you'll be making your speech. Picture the chairs the audience will sit in. Imagine the lighting and feel of the room from how bright the overhead lamps might be to the air conditioning. Is the stage raised above the floor? Is there a podium you'll be standing behind? Will there be a microphone or will you be wearing a headset? Imagine how either looks down to the foam piece over the microphone head or the tiny earphones. Step three, view as third person. Now you're somebody in the audience watching as you speak. You see yourself dressed in a suit, standing upright delivering words clearly and directly, raising your pitch to make a point or lowering your pitch to make a joke. You're seeing all the hand gestures, head tilts, and facial expressions you'd see if you were watching the speech instead of giving it. Step four, view as first person. At this point, you go back into yourself giving the speech and addressing the audience. 
You can hear how your words sound in your head. You note the distance from your mouth to the microphone. You can see the audience members' faces as they're paying attention. You hear the reverb from your voice echoing throughout the room, whether it's a little or a lot. You feel your hands resting on the wood surface of the podium. You see the words printed on the page you're reading from, or you see yourself moving around the stage without a script. You sense how your body's reacting, the nervous energy in your gut, the clarity in your head, the blood flow in your arms and legs. You hear the applause at the end, down to each individual hand clap. Step five, wrap it up. You let the seed fade to black or white if you prefer in your head. You spend a few moments slowly coming back to, remembering the scene that's just transpired and marking each feeling you look out for when you're giving the speech. Recall specifically all the choices you made that were bold and daring as opposed to conservative and fearful. Then you gently open your eyes. So that's that example. Leave a like and subscribe if you have enjoyed the video up till this point. So, we call the previously described process visualization, but that phrasing isn't entirely accurate since most people associate visualization with seeing things with one's eyes. It happens. A more exact term for this process might be multisensory imagination or mental rehearsal because a full process draws from all the senses we possess. The first sense is visual, the second sense is auditory, which is your sense of hearing, the third sense is kinesthetic, which is sense of touch, the fourth sense is your sense of smell, and the fifth is your sense of taste. It's easiest for us to imagine visual, v visually, I guess, during mental rehearsal. That's my mistake, by the way, not the book's mistake. But never underestimate the power of the other four senses, as well as the emotional sensations. They're responsible for some of our strongest memories. The sound of a band, the smell of a rainy afternoon, the taste of an ice cream sundae or the touch of a fuzzy sweater. During visualization, try as hard as you can to incorporate those other senses as well as how your scene looks to the eye. Studies have shown that our brain treats visualizations the same way as it treats actual memories. So our imagined memories, which are visualizations, are treated the same as actual memories, which is pretty darn cool. And it's pretty, well, how do you say it? It's conducive towards a person accepting the value of visualization and wanting to incorporate visualization in their own life. So you should try it out. If you can visualize to a deep level using all five senses and emotional projections, your brain is going to instill it as something you've already experienced. So one area where I think this can be very useful for men is if they do that, if they do a visualization of them approaching women and the approach going successfully. When you visualize jet skiing, playing professional football, or being shot out of a cannon, your brain is just going to assume you've actually done so. You might logically know better, but emotionally you will be even you will be more even keeled and calm, ready to tackle adversity. This can be key in building your yes response. When you're about to do something you've never done before, most of the anxiety and tension you feel happens before you actually start doing it. The nervousness you feel in a new endeavor usually comes up when you're anticipating doing it. When you're actually doing it, 
most of that anxiety goes away. Fear four. If the brain treats visualization the same way it treats real memories, you can trick your brain into building a belief in yourself. Sure, you might only be visualizing skydiving, but if you do it thoroughly enough, your brain is going to understand that the fear that leads to a no response isn't necessary or even helpful. So yeah, guys, leave a like if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe down below if you want to see more self-improvement content like this. I hope you enjoyed. I'm out. Peace.